hurry to Anu's aid while Enlil apprehended Alalu. Let justice prevail, Enlil exclaimed in a fit of anger. No, no, interjected Enki. Justice has already been served. The poison resides within him. He ingested it himself. Alalu was imprisoned for a requisite period as dictated by the law. Anu recovered and convened a meeting of the seven who judge. Anu assumed the highest position, presiding over the gathering. Seated to his right were Enki, Anzu, and Nungal. While Enlil, Abgal, and Alalgar sat on his left, Enlil spoke up, saying, In the name of justice, and in accordance with Alalu's decree, a new battle transpired, and Alalu suffered defeat. Enki inquired, What is your response? The fight transpired in pursuit of justice, and I have relinquished the throne. Interrupting Alalu, Enlil declared, and in his defeat, he committed an abominable crime. Death is the punishment. Enki asked once more, What do you have to say? Alalu remained silent for a moment, then spoke slowly and softly. On Nibiru, I was the rightful king, and Anu served as my cupbearer. I reigned for nine shars until Anu himself usurped my throne. We vied for rulership through single combat, and fearing for my life, I departed Nibiru and discovered a new world. Here, I found the gold of salvation, and the promise of reclaiming kingship on Nibiru was bestowed upon me. Subsequently, Enki arrived on Earth and was appointed as my successor on Nibiru. Following that, Enlil laid claim to Anu's succession for himself, and eventually Anu himself arrived. Fortune played a part and deceived Enki, who was hailed as the Lord of Earth rather than Nibiru. Enlil then assumed authority over Earth and banished Enki to the distant Abzu. My heart aches, seething with agony as he triumphantly planted his feet upon my chest. Anu spoke, I defeated him in a fair fight, and you interfered with my lineage by devouring my manhood. Enlil spoke, The accused has admitted to the crime. May death be your sentence. To death, said Alalgar. Death, said Abgal. Death, said Nungal. Enki spoke. Death will come naturally. Alalu swallowed Anu's entrails. Anzu in turn said, Let Alalu be bound to earth until the end of his days. The king of Nibiru pondered and then declared, Die in exile. Alalu must perish in exile. Everyone exchanged glances as Anu explained his decision. When I return to Nibiru, Alalu shall accompany me on my ship. However, he will not set foot on Nibiru. We will orbit Lahmu, where there is water and a breathable atmosphere. Alalu shall spend the remainder of his days in solitude on Lahmu. We can use a small celestial ship for a safe landing. The decision was unanimous. Anu continued, Nungal will pilot the great ship. I will remain on Nibiru while Nungal returns with other Anunnaki from Nibiru to Earth for gold mining. Anzu will join us to transport Alalu on the small ship. And so it was done. Anu bid farewell to his sons and the remaining Anunnaki. Then, the Nibiru royalty departed from planet Earth. As they approached Lamu to exile Alalu in the vicinity of the Red Planet, Anzu spoke up. I will not return with the small celestial ship, 
I will land on Lamu with Alalu and remain by his side. When he succumbs to the poison in his entrails, I will give him a burial befitting a king. As for myself, I have already made my name. Others will speak of me as the companion of a king in exile. I have witnessed and will witness things that others will not on this strange planet facing the unknown. My name will be remembered as that of a hero. Alalu was in tears, and Anu was amazed. Then he spoke, I raise my hand before you, O Anzu, and swear this oath to you. On the next journey, a ship will encircle Lamu and land in your presence. If I find you alive, you shall be proclaimed the ruler of Lamu, and once a station is established there, you shall be its commander. Anzu nodded in gratitude and agreement, and preparations for the installation in the small ship commenced. They were provided with supplies and fish suits equipped with eagle helmets. The ship departed towards Lamu, gradually vanishing on the horizon. For nine shars, Alalu reigned as the king of Nibiru. For eight shars, he commanded Eridu on Earth. However, in the ninth shar, fortune turned against him, and he met his demise in exile on Lahmu. On Earth, a lengthy discussion ensued to determine the next course of action. Anki requested Alalgar to oversee Eridu, while he himself went to the Abzu. There he designed and devised technological equipment to penetrate the depths of the Earth and explore its innermost regions. He sent the plans to Nibiru for the engineers to construct. In Eden, Enlil meticulously surveyed the activities, carefully numbering the mountains, valleys, rivers, and plains. He found great pleasure in the snow-capped mountains of northern Eden and began preparations for a celestial ship platform, a personal endeavor of his. Meanwhile, the royal ship journeyed through space towards Nibiru, where Anu received a joyful welcome. He issued instructions to establish intermediary stations, with Lamu being the first and Kingu as the second. Anu initiated new studies of all the planets, and envisioned a caravan of celestial ships traveling between Nibiru and Earth tracing various routes. To accomplish this, he introduced a new class of spaceships and selected new Anunnaki members to learn and train for the mission. Anu transmitted the plans to Anki and Enlil on Earth and received blueprints from Anki's team of engineers to construct the necessary equipment. Subsequently, a new mission from Nibiru embarked towards Earth consisting of 50 chosen women. Among them was Ninma, the esteemed lady, who also happened to be the half-sister of Enki and Enlil, and the daughter of Anu. Ninma possessed great knowledge in the field of medicine, and was skilled in the art of healing. She had heard of the vertigo caused by the sun and Earth's rotational cycle, so she prepared a remedy for it. As promised by Anu, the mission from Nibiru encircled Lamu. When they approached the ship, they discovered Anzu near a river, lifeless. Ninma immediately took charge and began her actions. She retrieved the pulsator from her bag and aimed it at Anzu's heart. Then she took out the emitter and directed the life-giving emissions of its crystals towards Anzu's body. 
Ninma repeated this process 60 times, directing the pulsator and emitter towards Anzu. On the 60th attempt, Anzu opened his eyes and moved his lips. Ninma poured the water of life over him and moistened his lips with it, then placed the food of life in his mouth. And thus, a miracle occurred. Anzu rose from the dead. Upon regaining consciousness, he recounted Alalu's final moments and how he had prepared his funeral by covering the mountain that rose from the plain with stones. The Anunnaki then carved Alalu's face upon the rocky mountain and left it exposed. Ninma declared, Let Alalu's face eternally behold the land where he found gold. And as for you, Anzu, King Anu, my father has commanded the fulfillment of the promise made to you. Twenty men will accompany you here on Lamu, and a way station must be built. Spaceships will depart Earth and arrive here, laden with gold. The gold stored here will be collected by celestial ships that will transport it to Nibiru. Anzu, you shall be the commander of Lamu. My life belongs to you, O Ninma, the Great Lady. My gratitude towards Anu knows no bounds. And then the celestial ship carrying Ninma and the other Anunnaki departed from Lamu towards Earth. Anzu and other Anunnaki remained on Lamu with the intention of creating an intermediary way station. Meanwhile, the gigantic ship was heading towards Earth, observing the moon and analyzing the possibility of another way station. Nungal led the ship to the ditch in the waters closest to Eridu, where they disembarked on a pier built by Enlil. Vessels were no longer needed. Enki and Enlil welcomed their sister, Ninma. She informed them about all the news, what had happened on Nibiru, the death of Alalu, the survival of Anzu on Lamu, and the construction of the way station. Enki expressed his approval, while Enlil was perplexed. Ninma said, Anu's decisions are unalterable, it's his word, and I have more news. I brought relief from illness, I brought the seeds of healing. From her pouch, Ninma drew the seeds. They need to be planted, and after their growth, a juice can be made. The Anunnaki must drink this juice, and then all diseases will disappear, said Ninma. But these seeds must be sown in a warm and cool place. They require heat and water to thrive. Enlil invited Ninma to come to the ship. I know the perfect spot for it, he said. Thus, the two brothers entered the ship and headed towards the snow-covered mountains next to the cedar forest. Enlil and Ninma talked and expressed their love and affection for each other. Ninma told Enlil about Ninurta, explaining that the prince was ready to join them on Earth. Enlil, the father of Ninurta, was the son of Antu, the lawful wife of Anu. He was the legal heir and successor of Anu. Ninma, the half-sister of Enlil and the mother of Ninurta, was the first daughter of Anu. Ninma was extremely beautiful and full of wisdom, and she was skillful and quick to learn. Enlil and Ninma caressed each other, but Enlil did not impregnate Ninma. Then they returned to Eridu. On the way, Enlil showed the landscape and presented the Eden in all its vastness. He explained his entire plan. Far from Eridu, where the dry land begins, will be my abode. It will be named Larsa, the place of command located on the banks of the Buranu, the river of deep waters. In the future, a city called Lagash will emerge. Between the two, I have drawn a line, 
and nearby there will be a city called Shurubak, the city of refuge. This will be your city. It will stand on the central line and lead to the fourth city, Nibruki. Nibruki will be the crossing point, the link between heaven and earth. It will house the Tablets of Destinies and control all quests. Together with Eridu, these five cities will exist forever. Enlil then revealed a crystal tablet with several markings and explained that in the future, there will be a place for the ship to arrive from Nibiru to Earth. Ninma was amazed at the complexity of it all. She understood Enlil's disagreement with Anu's plan and the creation of an intermediary station on Lamu. It is a magnificent plan, said Ninma, visibly emotional. Enlil's plan included the creation of a city for her. A healing city, a healing station. But, warned Ninma, do not go beyond this plan set by your father. Do not offend your brother Enki either. You are as wise as you are beautiful, Enlil said. Meanwhile, in the Abzu, Enki was also devising plans. His plans differed significantly from those of Enlil. He contemplated where he could construct dwellings for the Anunnaki, where he could establish his own residence, and where he could access the depths of the earth. From his celestial ship, he surveyed the entire expanse of the Abzu meticulously. The Abzu was a distant land, situated beyond the waters of the Eden, known for its abundance and perfection. The region boasted powerful rivers coursing through it. Enki built his abode near the flowing pure waters amidst the heart of the Abzu. In this land, Enki designated the place of the deep which allowed the Anunnaki to penetrate the depths of the earth. Through inner tunnels, they could explore the veins of precious gold. Enki arranged the necessary equipment for crushing the extracted gold, including the necessary tools and machinery. Subsequently, the gold would be transported using celestial ships to the landing place located in the Cedar Mountains. From there, spaceships would convey the gold to the way station on Lamu. Consequently, numerous extraterrestrials arrived on the planet. Some were assigned to the Eden under Enlil's supervision, while others joined Enki in the Abzu. Another group was directed to Shurubak with Ninma. On Nibruki, the celestial link between heaven and earth, Enlil gathered and oversaw all the missions. Enki frequently traveled between Eridu and the Abzu, diligently supervising all activities. Construction on Lamu progressed, and the way station received a considerable workforce. Thus, two shars elapsed until Anu issued his official order on the seventh day. On Earth, this was considered the seventh day, a day of rest originally decreed by Enki. 600 individuals assembled to heed Anu's proclamation. Enki was accompanied by his vizier Isimud, Nungal the pilot, Alagar the lord of Eridu, and Abgal, who commanded the landing place. In the Aden, Enlil observed the transmission alongside Ninma and her entourage of maidens. On Lamu, various workers congregated with Anzu, it was then that Anu spoke. You are heroes, the true saviors of Nibiru. The fate of our entire planet rests in your hands. Your deeds will be eternally remembered, and your names will be revered. Henceforth, those on earth shall be known as the Anunnaki, meaning those who came from heaven to earth. And those residing on Lahmu shall be called the Igigi, signifying those who observe and see. Everything is now prepared. Let the flow of gold commence, and let Nibiru be saved. However, Anu, 
distant on Nibiru, could not foresee the impending turmoil. It began with the predicament involving their own offspring, long before the arrival of the Anunnaki on Earth. Enki, as the eldest son of Anu, was not the legitimate heir due to his status as the son of a concubine. Ninma, the eldest daughter, had been chosen by Anu to marriage Enki, his eldest son. The intention was for the firstborn of this union to possess a double inheritance and become the rightful successor. However, Ninma was in love with her half-brother, Enlil. Consequently, Enlil impregnated Ninma, and Ninurta, the prince who would soon be on Earth, was born as the son of Enlil and Ninma. Enraged at the time, and still on Nibiru, Anu forbade Ninma from marrying anyone. Consequently, Enki married a princess, the daughter of Alalu, the beautiful Damkina. Enki and Damkina had a son named Marduk, whose name meant one born in a pure place. Enki, Anu's eldest son, had a son named Marduk through marriage. On the other hand, Enlil, Anu's rightful heir, had a son named Ninurta, but not through marriage. Enlil's story in this regard unfolded on Earth rather than Nibiru. Enlil fell in love with Sud, one of Ninma's maidens, while she was bathing in a cold mountain. Enlil took Sud to his abode in the cedar grove and offered her the elixir of the fruit of Nibiru, which grew on earth. The two drank it, and Enlil expressed his intentions. However, Sud revealed her virginity and that she had never been kissed. Nonetheless, Enlil laughed and kissed her, impregnating her with the seed of life. Ninma considered this act immoral and accused Enlil before the seven who judge. Enlil was sentenced to exile in a land of no return, far away from all cities. Abgal, Enlil's pilot, transported him to a distant land amidst inhospitable mountains. Descending the ship to the ground, Abgal said, hospitable mountains. Descending the ship to the ground, Enlil, I did not choose this place by chance. In a nearby cave, Enki hid the weapons of terror that were in Alalu's ship. Take possession of the weapons, and you will regain your freedom. Having said that, Abgal departed, leaving Enlil alone in that place. In the Eden, Sud confided in her commander, Ninma, revealing that she was pregnant with Enlil's child. Ninma conveyed the news to Anki, the Lord of Earth, who was then supreme on Earth. Anki decided to summon the Seven Who Judge, and during the trial, Sud was questioned about the possibility of accepting Enlil as her husband. After accepting, Enlil returned from exile to marry Sud, now known as Ninlil, the Lady of the Mandate. They had a son named Nanar, the Bright One. Nanar was said to be the first child of two Anunnaki conceived on Earth, a royal seed from Nibiru conceived on Earth. As soon as Nanar, the son of Enlil and Ninlil was born, Enki approached Ninma to talk. He had built his house in the Abzu and adorned it with a bright metal he called silver, as well as lapis lazuli. Enki invited his half-sister to join him in the Abzu and forsake her devotion to Enlil. In the Abzu, Enki reminded Ninma of their engagement and their love. They kissed, and Enki asked Ninma to bear him a son. From their union, a daughter was born, disappointing Enki. Ninma encouraged him to embrace their daughter, but Enki insisted, I will have a son with you, my sister. 
Thus, they engaged in another relationship, and another daughter was born. Enki cried out, A son! I need a child! I need a boy! In a fit of rage, Ninma pronounced a curse on Enki, wishing that all food would become poison in his viscera, causing pain in his jaw, teeth, and ribs. Enki's vizier, Isimud, summoned the Anunnaki to implore Ninma for relief from the curse. Enki vowed to distance himself from Ninma's private parts, and one by one she removed all ailments from Enki's body. Ninma returned to Eden without marrying anyone, as commanded by her father, Anu. In turn, Enki brought his son Marduk and his wife Damkina to Earth. Enki had five more children with Damkina, as well as with concubines. Their names were Nergal, Gibel, Ninagal, Ningish Sida, and Dumuzi, the youngest son. On the other side of Anu's generation, Enlil and Ninma brought their son Ninurta to Earth. Additionally, Enlil had another son named Ishkur with his wife Ninlil. The Anunnaki on Earth, or the sons of Anu, included Enki, the firstborn of Anu with a concubine, Ninma, the first daughter of Anu, and Enlil, the son of Anu with Queen Antu. Enlil had three sons, Nanar, the first son of two Anunnaki born on Earth, Ishkur, and Ninurta, son of Enlil and Ninma, born on Nibiru and brought to Earth. Enki was the father of Marduk, who was the son of Enki and his wife Damkina, in addition to the two daughters he had with Ninma and the Anunnaki children Nergal, Gibil, Ninagal, Ningishida, and Dumuzi. In this way, two clans settled on Earth, and later they would engage in war. In the The Abzu, gold was extracted from Earth's golden veins and transported to the landing place. The Igigi then carried the gold to a way station on Lamu using spaceships. From Lamu, the precious metal was delivered to Nibiru in celestial ships. On Nibiru, the gold was finally ground into powder and spread into the atmosphere for the planet's protection. Gradually, Earth's gold healed Nibiru's wounds, holes, and cracks. Enki built a magnificent dwelling in Eridu and elevated it from Earth to heaven like a mountain. He brought Damkina and Marduk to live with him and proceeded to teach Marduk various things. Meanwhile, on Nibruki, Enlil established a dazzling construction that served as a link between heaven and earth. Their words reached Lamu and Nibiru. The rays emanating from their construction could penetrate the heart of all lands, allowing them to observe everything. From atop the chamber, Enlil studied and observed everything, including the secrets of the sun and the moon which he recorded in secret formulas. He refined the celestial zenith, established the twelve houses, and marked the sun's family with twelve emblems. The tablets of destinies gleamed in their royal abode, while the working class toiled diligently. The Earth's cycles astonished them, and they received small quantities of the healing elixir. The Anunnaki in Eden grew weary, and the work in the Abzu was arduous. The Igigi on Lamu constantly complained. At Anu's command, Anzu, the commander of Lamu, was received on Earth. Enki and Enlil 
reveal to him the secrets of the Abzu and the Heaven-Earth link on Nibruki. Anzu defended the Igigi of Lahmu, who requested rest on Earth whenever spaceships traveled between Earth and Lamu. Received in Enlil's chamber, Anzu intended to steal the Tablets of Destinies. He was a prince among princes and had promised relief to the Igigi. Enlil left the shrine and Anzu remained at the entrance without arousing suspicion. Then he seized the Tablets of Destinies and departed from the Celestial Chamber towards the landing place, where the Igigi had gathered, awaiting his return to declare Anzu the King of the Earth and Lahmu. From the top of the chamber, Enlil, perceiving the theft and afflicted with treachery, angrily questioned Enki about Anzu's identity. In Nibruki, the Anunnaki sought the words of Anu. The order was to stop Anzu and retrieve the Tablets of Destinies. But Anzu, in possession of the Tablets, seemed invincible. Nevertheless, Ninurta stood ready to fight and recover what rightfully belonged to his father. Javelins were hurled at Anzu, but they missed. Arrows were launched, but they also missed him. So a mighty weapon was prepared, a Tilu missile. The instructions were for Ninurta and Anzu to approach each other, wing to wing, and launch the missile, creating a whirlwind and a storm of dust. And then, like a ball of fire, Anzu fell. The earth shook and the heavens shook. Ninurta took the Tablets of Destinies and made Anzu his prisoner. Quickly, Ninurta was applauded at the landing place, and the Anunnaki who had been taken prisoner were freed and before the judges, Anzu was sentenced to death. Then, the life fluid of Anzu extinguished. Ninurta said, Leave his body to the vultures. And Enki answered, Lead Anzu's body to Lamu, that it may be buried beside Alalu. They share the same ancestral seed. Let Marduk, my son, conduct Anzu's corpse and let him rest there, becoming the commander of Lamu. Ninurta, who was knowledgeable about the inner workings of planets, suggested the creation of a new city of metal for easier and faster shipments. Thus, those who were weary could return to Nibiru, and new Anunnaki could come to Earth in their place. In this way, construction began in the Eden, and it took three shars until the city of Bad Tibira was created. Ninurta, who had made the suggestion, became the first commander. The flow of gold to Nibiru became easier and faster. Many of those who were on Earth and Lamu returned to Nibiru, including Alalgar, Abgal, and Nungal. They were received as heroes by the inhabitants of the planet Nibiru, especially the younger ones who desired to participate in the missions and experience the excitement. They were unaware of the great calamities that existed on Earth, Lamu, and in the heavens. In Bad Tibira, gold was smelted and refined, and then sent to Lamu in spaceships. Pure gold was transported from Lamu to Nibiru in celestial ships. As Ninurta had conceived, gold flowed from Abzu to Nibiru. However, what went unnoticed was the discontent among the newly arrived Anunnaki. Enki, preoccupied with other matters in the Abzu, remained unaware of the situation. He established a new facility known as the House of Life and invited his son, Ningishida, to join him in its operations. 
Enki was particularly intrigued by certain creatures that dwelled among the tall trees, using their front paws as hands. Additionally, there were peculiar upright walking beings observed in the grassy steppes. Enki diligently delved into the secrets of life and death, equipping the House of Life with meticulously crafted tools and equipment. Engrossed and captivated, Enki devoted himself entirely to his studies. However, Ninurta, stationed in Bad Tibira, was the first to notice a decline in gold mining operations. Enlil dispatched Ninurta to the Abzu to investigate the cause, accompanied by Enugi, the chief officer. Enugi himself had heard first-hand complaints from the Anunnaki and relayed all he had learned to Ninurta. The work here is unbearable, he exclaimed. Ninurta shared this matter with Enki, who promptly summoned Enlil. The commanding lord, Enlil, arrived at the Abzu and settled in a residence near the excavation site. It was then that a group of Anunnaki workers launched an assault on Enugi, the chief mining officer. They set fire to their tools and subsequently approached Enlil's dwelling to express their grievances. Kalkal, the gatekeeper, barred the entrance and summoned Nusku, Enlil's vizier. Nusku, awakening Enlil from his rest, reported, My lord, we are surrounded. The Anunnaki workers are here, protesting against the strenuous labor. Anki and Ninurta were summoned, and Enlil inquired, What is happening? Who instigated this rebellion? In unison, they responded, we did, all of us. Enlil relayed the events to Anu, who swiftly replied, We require the gold. The work cannot cease. Enki contemplated, The labor is indeed burdensome, as we all know. The rebellion is not against Enlil, but against the work itself. Enugi, the chief mining officer, was released and consulted. He conveyed, Since the heat on Earth intensified, the work has become unbearable, intolerable. Ninurta proposed, Let the rebels return to Nibiru and let other Anunnaki take their place. Enlil turned to Enki and asked, Is it possible to create new tools for the Anunnaki that would alleviate the need for tunnels? Enki responded, Summon my son Ningishida. I must speak with him. After their conversation, Enki made an announcement. There might be a viable solution. Let us fashion a primitive worker. Lulu shall be its name. And let this new being shoulder the burdensome toil of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki leaders were rendered speechless. Who could have conceived such a solution? Would anyone have ever imagined it? Thus, they summoned Ninma, renowned for her healing and nurturing abilities. Ninma replied, I have never encountered anything like this. All beings descend from a seed. Each being evolves throughout eternity from another. None emerge from nothingness. Enki smiled and said, How right you are, my sister. Then Enki continued, I must reveal a secret of the Abzu. The being we need already exists. All we need to do is brand it with our essence, with the essence of Nibiru, with the Anunnaki essence. Let me create Lulu, the primitive worker, Enki said. Astral Citizens is home to unbiased and rare UFO news. Like and share this video and comment below. Click the thanks button below this video to show support. If you want to see more, make sure to follow us. Join the free UFO social network app and become a true citizen of the stars.